That's kind of amazing. <laughs> it's like, uh, yeah. And he's such a wonderful guy too. He's uh, pretty, like I've been so fortunate that he's, he works with me. Yeah, we're, we're live now. Okay, welcome to Joshig. Just shutting my window, it's cold. I have my blankie. Um, <laughs> I'm happy everyone's here tonight. I'm happy I'm here tonight. Um, Monique Manach and Dishnikov, so I'm going from Barrier Lake and Dojava. Uh, my name is Monique Manach and welcome to Azizikikon. Anishinaabe Azizikikon. It's, uh, it's our lecture series in partnership between uh, Indigenous Culture and Media Innovations and the Digital Artist Resource Center. So um, tonight, um, our, our lecture, our, our panel, is on uh, web web art and activism, and we've got uh, Maze Longboat, uh, Sherry Osden No, and uh, Sherry McKay. So um, I think what we'll do is um, maybe we could start by um, having presentations, and then I'd love to get into a real good deep discussion with everyone. So I'm just going to go. Um, to my right here. So I'm going to start with, uh, unless you have a preference about who goes first, uh, it's, it's up to you guys. Uh, okay, so I'm going to, I'm going to start with Sherry McKay, if that's all right. Okay, everyone's good with that? Okay. All right, sounds good. <laughs> Hi, my name is Sherry McKay. I am um, an Anishinaabe. I live in Treaty One Territory, and I am a content creator primarily on the application TikTok. And I do different types of, I guess, not necessarily like web art, but activism within uh, social media. So I just wanted to share a couple of the, I guess, give a few examples of some of the things that um, I've done on TikTok. Uh, when I first started TikTok, there wasn't a large representation of indigenous people from what I seen. And so I seen that there was a need for it. So I wanted to kind of just put it out there because there was all these wonderful trends that I seen um, people doing and I kind of wanted to indigenize them some way, shape or form, uh, but also using my platform to bring some, some issues and awareness to, uh, to TikTok. And so I'm gonna try and share my screen here. These are short videos, they're like 59 seconds or less. <laughs> and so for anyone that doesn't necessarily know what TikTok is, is it's a, it's a very small, well, it's not very small, it's a huge app. And, uh, but you can do different types of trends and make videos just talking. Um, what I like to do is find sounds that kind of feed into a certain story or something that I wanna talk about. And fortunately, I find some of the greatest sounds that I think um, definitely speak to the message that I, I wanted to talk about. So things like cultural appropriation, things like the Indian Act in Canada and how it affects Indigenous people or residential schools, um, the relationship between Canada and Indigenous people. So here are some of the videos. So this is like a cultural appropriation video. <laughs> so this is a this is somebody who's quite prominent on YouTube for several years and they were a headdress and they refused after native TikTok had asked him to please remove remove it that they did not want to remove it. I'm trying to like minimize this. So this is my video. <laughs> I can't take it off. I can't take it off. Like Take it off. I can't. Take it off. I can't take it off. Like, take it off. I can't. And so that audio, the, the, <laughs> the fun thing about TikTok is that 
that audio will be something completely different. So then when you go to the original audio, you'll see that the video could be someone wearing a hat or someone just wearing makeup or something like that. So you have this cool ability to kind of, I don't want to use the word manipulate, but <laughs> to kind of just use the sound fitting. So this is an audio and this is an audio from, I believe the movie, um, 40 something. So it's a, it's a couple that's arguing and they're always arguing. So this is how I used the audio and, and here it goes. Why do we fight? I don't know. It makes no sense. It at makes all. no sense. When we get in a fight, look in my eyes and let's remember this moment right now and know that we never have to fight. But you're such a dick sometimes. I know I am a dick sometimes. People think I'm so nice, but I'm such a dick. Thank you for admitting that. And you get so mad at me. Oh I, my god. I feel like you want to kill me. I do want to kill you. I'm laughing on TikTok. <laughs> And so that kind of speaks to the narrative between uh, Indigenous peoples in Canada. And here is another one. And this is an audio that I seen so fit to talk about that the same thing, the relationship between Indigenous people in Canada and, um, but it's actually, just take a listen. And I use a lot of visuals to kind of tell the story um. Perhaps you have simply forgot what you signed, oh honestly Did you not read the colony policy That defined you as company property That wavered your say in autonomy The conglomerates got you in lock and key We put the dollar back into idolatry If you're upset you can rent an apology We are a family forged in bureaucracy No I in team, but, but there's calm in economy Were you expecting adventure? Were you hoping for fun? My friend, your indentured and pleasures exempt from your tenure, so venture back down to your slum. And I will share the last TikTok. Um, and this is a different content creator who kind of just created this two person conversation, and it sounded a lot like what happened in residential schools. So this is something that I kind of just uh, put together. Oh, how cute. Ah, thank you. Are you done with it? Sorry? Are you finished with it? Am, am I finished with my baby? Yeah, can I have it? No. The, the fuck? No, you can't have my baby. You're not even doing anything with it. What do you mean? It's a, it's a, it's my child. You're not even using it, dude. Using it? It's, it's my, it's a person. It's my child. Wow, you don't even know how to use a baby? Hey, cop? What's up? I'm the cop. This mom just admitted that she doesn't even know how to use her own baby, dude. Huh. Is this true? What do you mean use a baby? It is a human. It is my child. And this strange man is trying to take it from me. So, it sounds like you don't know how to use it. It's my kid! Sir, how would you use this child? I would love, support, and nurture it unconditionally while instilling good morals and self-confidence to not only allow, but encourage its development and growth into a well-adjusted, well-rounded, healthy adult. That one sounds like the right answer. Thank you. Ma'am, hand over the baby. So... Although I primarily focus on comedy, I try and find different avenues to tell stories that are digestible, but kind of thought provoking. And so that's how I've been using my social media platform to, um, to kind of create conversations with people that have no idea of uh, some of the things that we face as indigenous people and um, and some of the things that our ancestors faced as indigenous people. And so when you create a visual with a sound and then people click the sound and they, they see, oh, well, that's not exactly what that, like it fits so well, but at the same time, it's like, how, like, how does it fit so well? And how does it, you know, tell that story? Um, <laughs> I haven't done any of those things for quite some time because I find that the larger that my platform gets, uh, the more difficult it is to kind of police the comments and people who disagree with you um, on those types of topics. And so um, 
Yeah. Plus I haven't really found the perfect sound to talk about it more um, with the exception of creating my own sounds, of course, but I feel like the way I've used my platform with comedy and awareness that it's not that it makes it more like lighthearted. It's just that it, it kind of brings the way TikTok works is whether you want to see the video or not, if you're on the for you page, it just puts it in front of you. So I don't know who's going to see it. I don't know what their reaction is going to be. I don't know if it's going to be triggering for them. If they are, you know, someone who is directly affected by whatever it is I'm talking about, but the conversations need to be had. And so that's how I've used my platform. And I kind of feel like, I know that there's some like cuss words in there and I didn't know if I should use those clips or not, but those are some of my most favorite clips um, that really, you know, I would have people in the comments say like, wow, I had no idea because we think, okay, well in Canada, this, all of these things have just been surfacing over, you know, the past decade or two. And so there's a whole different generation that are on TikTok all across Turtle Island on the other side of us that have no idea, you know, that Indigenous people even exist, you know, or that I'm Indigenous. And they're like, well, because I don't fit the, the, the textbook or the Hollywood version of what people think Indigenous people look like that we don't exist. And I'm like, oh, heck, we exist. <laughs> like we're, you know, like there's a lot of us. And just because we don't look a certain way or talk a certain way, um, that doesn't mean that we exist when in fact, you know, our own existence right now is such a huge reason. Like our the 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 strength of our ancestors has brought us here. So I feel like I know I have red hair. I know how I look. I know I have lighter skin. I know all of these things. So sometimes people comment those, those things like, oh, you don't look native or you don't sound native. And the fact that we have so many different nations and we all look different and, you know, it's so important that that representation is out there for every single one of us that are so unique and look different, have different traditions. Um, it's important to show the world those things. And so like, that's kind of what I've been doing on native TikTok. So I don't know if I, if my time is up or if I just keep talking. <laughs> it's wonderful. I love that. I love, I love your humor. And I love how you were able to, uh, to take that and take existing sounds and put it into, uh, into videos that really told a story. It's difficult to do in 59 seconds or less. And I feel like doing that sometimes is an injustice and to, to the stories and the histories in itself. So, but you know, you put it out there and people will mm -hmm. just absorb it or they'll just go on to the next, you know. <laughs> Uh, it's why that format though why not like a two minute video or why not make your own sounds or that kind of thing mm -hmm. on tiktok that's the maximum time sure. is 15 seconds yeah so but again 59 seconds is a long time like it's it i mean if you're if you're standing sitting there staring at someone for 59 seconds straight in the face with no talking like it can seem like a really long time <laughs> You know, so like 59 seconds, it, it's a long time. But I, again, like I said, I feel like it's an injustice sometimes when we talk about really important things that we like, I, sometimes I'll say, you know, 59 seconds isn't enough time, but I'll give it, I'll give it a shot. Um, but then also it kind of pushes people to hit up Google and, and do some research on their own because they just got a little tiny tidbit, almost like a, like a commercial or something. And then it makes them want to kind of do their own research. Yeah. I hope. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Magritte, thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're going to go to Maze. Maze is sort of up on my, next on my, hi. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to say um, before I start, Sherry, that's, 
your work is amazing. I, I'm not on TikTok personally, but I do see it often on Twitter and on Instagram and on Facebook and stuff. And like, I knew native TikTok existed. I just haven't like done my own delving deeper into it. So thank you for exposing me um, to it. I'm definitely gonna go and take more, more time and look. Um, and I think the work that you're doing is really amazing for sparking conversations, um, especially with like, what is it, Gen Z technically, uh, this like, you know, our, our teenage um, nieces and nephews, um, you know, it's, and then also a whole bunch of like non-Indigenous peoples as well on, on TikTok. So yeah, thank you. Um, I guess I'll take it from here with my stuff then. Sound good? Cool. Yeah. Let's, let's chat more after this. Um, I'll just share my screen. Okay, can you see this Terra Nova thing? Cool. Uh, Sego, hi, uh, I'm Maze Longboat. I am uh, Ganyenge Haga or Mohawk from Six Nations of the Grand River. And I'm currently uh, residing um, on the traditional uh, unceded territory of um, the Ganyenge Haga people and the Anishinaabe people here in um, Jatjage or Muniyang or uh, what's commonly referred to now as Montreal. Um, and I am joining this panel um, of awesome web creators as uh, a game developer, but also uh, a producer of digital media, um, as a writer and as a digital media educator. Um, here is where I like to start my presentations off a lot of the time is just showing you kind of where it all began. Um, I, I don't know what like the technical term is, but I've heard this term thrown around a lot about like me being a mid twenties, you know, younger millennial type generation person as being like a digital native. Um, and I find that term really interesting um, because, you know, I was born into a world where like technology was already, you know, all pervasive in our homes and I've been able to see the rise of like, you know, smartphones and, you know, personal computers. And now, you know, what we're doing with these devices like TikTok um, and, and games are always like a huge part of that for me. So here I am, you know, as like a four, four year old um, playing on my computer, uh, enjoying my life, um, but also like actually shaping who I have eventually like become and will continue to grow as is like someone who really loves games. And I also like showing just this little Game Boy graphic because um, some of my first memories of like my life were uh, the excitement I felt about like going to Blockbuster on a Friday and like having my parent, um, my parents read me uh, a Game Boy and, and play Pokemon for, for the weekend and that being just like the highlight of my, my life um, and just being fascinated by all the stories that could be told within these things and just the fun I would have um, kind of bringing myself into another world. So these formative things in my early childhood has really like led me um, to exploring um, indigenous representation in games, but also indigenous people creating games as developers. Um, and so from, you know, being a really young, young child and then moving into like my preteen and teen years, um, I think World of Warcraft was also a really big moment in my life too, because in the game, um, there are these playable uh, race of characters called Tauren that live in this, I guess, fantasy planes environment within the game. Um, and they they are, they definitely like have a lot of indigenous iconography associated with them. Um, it's just kind of really played up and it's a trope and it's, it's ultimately damaging, you know, it's all these discussions about co cultural appropriation that we've been having, you know, these, these images um, and artworks were created by, you know, non-Indigenous people at these big game companies and, and Indigenous people really were not controlling the narrative of how these types of characters in this game um, were being created. So this kind of, on the one hand, you know, I recognize that it's damaging, but then I also had this moment when I first encountered these things of being like, whoa, like, there are indigenous presences within these media that I'm consuming um, as a young person. And I wanted to play as these things, like to be, to represent myself as an avatar in a way that I felt 
empowered and comfortable to do. Obviously, since then, I've learned like so much about these power structures at play and, and colonialism and systems of, of oppression um, that, you know, I'm much less comfortable with this now. Um, but it was meaningful in that moment to see myself kind of represented in something um, that was meaningful to me at the time. Um, from there, um, I moved into like kind of my university years, going to do my undergraduate um, studies at University of British Columbia in the First Nations and Indigenous Studies program there. And that was when I was first kind of exposed to Indigenous digital media creation. Um, these are a couple of logos from um, projects that Aboriginal Territories in Cyberspace, um, which is a research network uh, based at Concordia University, um, is have been working on. And um, it, it, when I was studying, um, it just really being exposed to these types of projects um, where I could see Indigenous peoples utilizing computers and the internet um, and creating beautiful and engaging things um, made me want to do the same. So once I learned about these um, these types of creators, um, I chose to direct um, my master's work toward um, investigating Indigenous video games specifically and looking at not just representation, just a little bit of that. There, there's been a lot of work done um, by some really amazing thinkers uh, to this point, but I really wanted to focus on um, the methods of indigenous video game development and like what that looks like um, for creators. So here are just a couple examples um, of Al Kanaka, which was produced um, in 2018 with a group of uh, Hawaiian uh, workshop participants that had some who, some of which who had never made a game before, but they were able to make a game in, in a three week workshop um, with the Initiative for Indigenous Futures and Aboriginal Territories in Cyberspace. Um, on the top right, there's Thunderbird Strike made in 2017 uh, by um, Dr. Elizabeth Laponce, who's uh, a very prominent uh, Anishinaabe and Métis um, video game developer based um, in uh, Michigan currently, uh, at the University of Michigan, and, or sorry, no, Michigan State University. And um, the, in, the gift below on the bottom um, is from Never Alone, uh, made in 2014. Um, and this game, while not directly created by uh, an indigenous led production studio, um, worked very, very closely and were um, partnered with uh, the Inupiaq community of the Cook Inlet Tribal Council in Alaska. So these are all games made um, either by indigenous peoples um, entirely or with heavy, heavy and in-depth consultation um, with community. Um, this was the title uh, of my master's thesis, um, Terra Nova and Acting Video Game Development Through Indigenous-Led Creation. Um, and it asked this question, what makes a video game indigenous and how will the game I create be informed by my own experience as an indigenous person? Um, and that game ended up being uh, this, uh, which is the images you saw when I started the presentation um, called Terra Nova. And so I guess before I kind of dive into what Terra Nova is, um, I mean, my main motivation for, for doing my graduate uh, studies was to obviously investigate this question and learn more about Indigenous video game development, but I also really wanted to just see what I could do um, if I put my mind to making my own game, even though I don't have, didn't have any experience whatsoever. Um, so Terra Nova, this game, um, takes place, uh, on earth in the far, far distant future, long after an environmental catastrophe, um, forced humanity to kind of abandon the planet and go colonize another world somewhere else. Um, but not everyone from earth could leave, uh, had the privilege to leave or, you know, had the means. And so some humans had to, had to stay behind. Um, and, and what they did was what we always do. We adapt, we grow, we change, um, and we, we make the best of any situation we're kind of thrown in. So a new type of human um, and culture kind of emerged after this moment. Um, and that's kind of where the game predominantly 
takes place is in this kind of post post apocalyptic world um, where the humans that stayed behind are kind of known are known as earthborn humans and the humans that left are known as starborn humans. Um, and this is just kind of what the early concept art uh, of the game looked like um, done by a wonderful Mi'kmaq artist and illustrator and animator, um, Ray Kaplan from the Stagush. Um, so yeah, these were kind of the first images that were produced. Uh, a little bit more about the starborn humans. They 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 kind of live in this this giant spaceship. Um, and it, you know, I was really interested in the game of of kind of telling, not kind of presenting it as a dichotomy between you know indigenous and settler or you know um, first peoples or like alien peoples or colonizers. Um, but what I was really interested in when was in was exploring kind of the narrative gray areas that exist, um, between these two people and, and, and really explore like what a first contact scenario would look like, um, if, and when it happens in the future. So the, the big moment of the, of the narrative of the game is the starborn humans coming back, um, to their, homeland that they don't remember is their homeland and meeting um, and coming across the earthborn humans that that were left behind and have you know burgeoned into something new and incredible um so the game is the narrative is kind of steered by two characters um this earthborn character named tara who's this um, elder woman and a leader in her community um, she's kind of like this steward of the the community's relationship to the the land and the water that is um, around their community, um, and she's kind of the one that's charged with um, investigating this like big, you know, starship crash that happens, and um, so that's who player one kind of plays as. Um, player two is uh, assigned to Nova, who's a really young um, starborn inventor type. Uh, guy and he um, he's the game starts with him um, kind of on his way to learn how to be a colonizer but his is a uh, his commute kind of gets interrupted by this giant starship crash that was unexpected um, and he's kind of thrown out into the wild it doesn't really know where he is or what he's what he's doing but he's just trying to like reunite with his his people again um, so these are the two perspectives in this that are played in this two-player game um, here are just some concepts uh, art that was done just to show you what kind of like ver visual flavor um, each of the two communities um, were bringing with them. So we have, you know, uh, the Earthborn on the left and the Starborn on the right with robots and suits and all this cool sci-fi stuff. Uh, and this is what the pixel art style of this 2D platformer game um, looked like uh, this was kind of like the first proof of concept of like what this art style would look like. And then um, this was the environment. And then we kind of made the characters from there using that concept art um, that we had, I just previously showed you. So these are, these are the characters you play as um, Tara and Nova. And then here's just a little clip of a, uh, that shows the gameplay. So it's a two player split screen cooperative game um, with an interactive narrative element. So um, you're seeing both characters kind of like walk back and forth and jump and you can press a button and interact with things that are labeled in your environment to learn more about them and choose what how you want to um, interact with them. So this interaction steered, you know, the narrative forward to kind of contextualize everything that was going on uh, for players as they move through the world. And also, um, I won't spoil it, but eventually, the, the two characters, Tara and Nova, make their way to one another. Um, and they have this uh, inter first contact interaction and players get to decide how they react. Um, eventually, uh, players will find out that, that the two characters kind of have to cooperate if they're gonna move forward um, you know, as two communities. And, and so Tara helps Nova um, find his people. But what comes after that, uh, <laughs> I was not able to um, communicate. I'm, I kind of left the narrative more on a question. So um, I would encourage you know all of you, if you're interested, to go check it out. I'll post the link um, at the end of this presentation and maybe um, 
that you can follow up with like links to everyone at the end uh, at the end here. Um, so what did I learn? Um, this was kind of like how the team, <laughs> how I saw the team as cats furiously working. Um, but I, I couldn't do this alone. Uh, I mentioned Ray, who was the the uh, illustrator, the two D artist, and the animator on the project. Um, but we also had a sound designer, Beatrix Mersch, and we had um, a technical director who was Merdad uh, Dadashti. And so we had a kind of a 50-50 split within the team, 50% um, you know, indigenous identified people and 50% non-indigenous. Um, and it made for this really cool, intimate kind of working environment where we were almost reflecting like kind of the, the representation that was reflected in the story, you know, in both indigenous and non-indigenous um, in the characters. So um, I won't really get into all the details, but I learned a lot. Um, I had a lot of roles as the producer plus person. I was managing people, uh, but I was also writing the narrative. I was also building the levels with the art assets. Um, and I was paying people because people deserve to be paid. And that was an awesome, awesome opportunity that I had uh, during my master's to, to use some of the grant money that I, um, that I was awarded to um, make a really cool game with some cool people and, and learn from one another. Um, really briefly, so after my, my master's and after Terra Nova released, um, I started a, a full-time position with Aboriginal Territories in Cyberspace. Um, I had been working with them as a graduate research assistant for the two years that I was doing my master's. Um, but I, I, I started um, working full-time as the Skins Workshops uh, Associate Director. And the Skins Workshops are uh, a series of digital media workshops aimed at engaging, um, you know, uh, providing Indigenous youth with the tools to um, create things like video games, um, machinima, things that are, uh, machinima are like um, movies made in virtual environments um, and virtual worlds, and then also doing like character design and 3D modeling and stuff. So I was leading that um, aspect of Abtech's research for the last, uh, for the for a year and a half after I graduated. Um, and that was really amazing. I, I love teaching where I can. I love engaging and in, in learning from other people from all over and especially getting to work with indigenous youth, um, both you know within Canada, um, but also the US too and, and overseas at times, which was which was great making those types of connections. Um, but since February, I have been working with Unity. Um, and for those of you who don't know, Unity um, Technologies is uh, a company that uh, sells or I guess <laughs> produces this video game engine. Um, and it's free to use uh, for anyone out there who's interested. Um, but they basically kind of make money from um, like Unity Pro licenses and, and um, I guess they're like kind of the go-to platform for indie game developers to, to make their stuff. Uh, we made Terra Nova with Unity, for example, just because it was free and approachable and, and many, many developers um, who know like the coding and stuff know Unity. Um, so it just made a lot of sense. Um, but yeah, it's a popular game engine used to make 3D and 2D games. Um, but it's also like really powerful for real-time rendering um, in other industries that it's starting to branch out into, like animation and um, the automotive industry and architecture to like create these like 3D scenes for these different um, companies in these different industries. Um, so at Unity, I'm a developer relations manager, um, which means that I basically own the relationship between Unity and the support services that Unity offers and um, enterprise level Unity users, um, think like really big game studios. Um, and so like these big game studios are using Unity to, to make their stuff. Um, and so I'm kind of like their trusted advisor to those users, um, enabling them to make like the best projects that they possibly can. So it's really rewarding, it's really cool. I get to know about a lot of <laughs> secret projects that the public don't know about. Um, don't bother asking questions, I can't <laughs> answer any of them. Uh, in terms of specifics, but it's it, it's something that I never really imagined I'd be doing um, back when I was you know um, playing around on my family's computer as like a four year old um, drinking juice. So it's a really interesting kind of trajectory where I like kind of see um, my life kind of 
going down this interesting path and just like the the synchronicities at different times of my life um, and the, the the consistencies that keep happening so um yeah i'll i'll kind of leave it there i'll kind of um just do a little bit of wrap up um yeah i'm having a blast at unity by the way it's a really really amazing company if you want to know more about it i'm happy to talk about it if you're interested in like if you're a student and want to check out like what internship opportunities that they have or like if you're you know um already working in tech or even not in tech and you're interested in in like what they do um the company is really it really takes care of people um really well so i'm, I'm really lucky to to move kind of from academia into this like corporate quote unquote space that um really cares about about the people that are there um yeah so that's terranova that's me um and you can go download it for windows at um my itch.io page um and yeah we can you can send the link uh, after this if you can't find it but if you can just search my name and terranova it should come up thank you so much Nyawa. thank you mate that's absolutely phenomenal wow um i'm cognizant of the time too i have so many questions i want to ask all of you so i want to make sure i leave room for questions um so i'm gonna i'm gonna go over to sherry and uh we'll we'll run your present quite uh, your presentation and then uh, we can get into some i think some really cool discussion so amazing thank you so much um it was amazing seeing the other two's presentations and i am just going to Remember where the share screen button is. All right. Oh no. The share screen thing is over top of my play button. Okay, there we go. <laughs> I had to wait a moment. Um, so Tanshi, my name is Sherry Osden Nolt, and uh, I want to acknowledge that I'm currently an uninvited guest on the lands of the Anishinaabeg Nation, the traditional land of the Three Fires Confederacy, the Adawa, Potawatomi, and Ojibwe, and what is now home to the Delaware Nation, also known as the Chatham Kent region of Ontario. That is where I am at this moment. Um, and it's snowing. Whoop. Uh, I'm Métis, like uh, Red River, Driven West, Every Generation, kind of old school Métis of the Sheree and Bellinger, or Bellinger families. And um, I've been told Nault is like the Smith of Métis last names too, so there's that. Um, I decided to start with an image of my definitely not digital part of my art practice. Um, one of the things that really came to mind for me as I was prepping for this conversation regarding my relationship with the web, web art and activism um, is that I have in so many ways, like a very analog practice. Uh, many of the tools and ways of making that I use to share information and create connections or in 2020 uh, raise funds are very like punk DIY culture. Um, I'm a big fan of zines, of t-shirt fundraisers. This is a prisoner's rights t-shirt from someone else's fundraiser that I picked up that I was like, yeah, that's what I'm gonna wear to the talk tonight. Um, and uh, that kind of just gives a sense maybe of like who I am. So uh, I'm really excited to be here alongside these two folks who work in like maybe much more digital ways than me, but I really love seeing like the connections and the like progressive conversation that happens between like each of our ways of being and creating. Um, I also uh, somehow managed to do like web activism, given that I have like a very analog art practice thanks to social media. Um, Sorry, I made notes and then I went off notes. So now I'm scanning them to be like, what did I miss? Uh -huh. So um, this is an image of one of my sculptures um, that's been presented in a few different places. And it is kind of a subtle way of alluding to do how activism often shows up in my art practice. I use sculpture and the body a lot. Um, 
This is a replica of my nipple. I make a lot of them and leave them on beaches uh, as an art installation and a sort of intervention and a way of talking about like the presencing of queer and indigenous bodies. So this has been shown in a couple of places and now um, like will be shown as high quality photographs in the future. And um, I kind of want to talk about like that alongside other ways that um, I create activist art and it winds up having anything to do with the internet through a bit of a linear um, look starting from January 2020 because it sort of shows the way that the different things are integrated and flow together. Um, so I bet everybody remembers um, in January 2020, Wet'suwet'en was being uh, invaded yet again by the RCMP. Um, and that was really distressing for me. And while I am in this photo of some people at a protest because of physical health issues that I've had over the last few years of my life, I really wasn't able to go to things like blockades or sit-ins and feel like it was safe for me to risk a physical confrontation with police officers like so many people were doing. Um, and I actually found it really distressing to not be able to go be physically present. So one of the things I started looking at was how else I could support people who were doing that, who were going and physically putting themselves on the line to fight for our rights. Um, and what I wound up doing was creating this t-shirt design uh, that says disrupt settler colonialism. It's a um, Asima behind it, so tobacco plant. Um, and I drew this up after what Soden started being um, invaded and I posted it online to my different social media and I was like, who wants to pre-order? Um, I made a slightly naive but incredible commitment to giving all of the funds raised by the shirts to land defenders, um, which I was lucky that CERB existed when it did because it was like months of labor to mail out all these friggin' shirts after this that I was not getting paid for at all. Um, I'm told people who are more experienced and me following this project uh, tend to allocate some of the money that doesn't count as profit to paying themselves so that they can live. Luckily, CERB happened when it did. Um, alongside these t-shirts, I also created a zine um, on disrupting settler colonialism and what that really means. Kind of like a basic primer that I felt that some of my indigenous supporters who uh, paid for shirts wouldn't need, but something that they could hand off to someone else who they didn't wanna have to explain settler colonialism and how it impacted them negatively too. It also talks a bit about the transatlantic slave trade and how settler colonialism plays into that too um, for our black and Afro-indigenous kin. I am really interested in trying to make things as accessible as I can. So this is just an image of how the zine is available for download on my website. So anybody who wants to can print it at home. Um, it's a zine that there's never gonna be a copyright or a cost on. I want people to be able to access it and distribute it. And there's also like an easy digital download. You can flip through it on my Instagram. Um, I like trying to make things available as best I can. I also, prior to making the Disrupt Settler Colonialism shirt, had been making these two queer t-shirt designs for a few years. Um, so in 2020, I pre-sold these shirts, um, the Disrupt Settler Colonialism shirts, and then because of the pandemic starting, I wasn't able to get them printed until May sent them to everybody in May and um, during the pre-orders and over the kind of length of that fundraiser, raiser, I raised $2,670, which as a visual artist uh, is not the end amount of money that I ever personally could have given away. And so I was really, really excited about having that kind of like community support. Um, following sending all those shirts out in May, it was June. Black civil rights protests were starting in the United States, um, which I care very much about and I was really happy had been happening in its own way in Canada with the blockades, um, with shutdown Canada and that sort of thing. And it was also, um, or it is Pride Month in June in Toronto, Ontario at least. Um, I don't know how universal that is. 
because of that, I decided that for June, what I would do is I would switch my focus to selling shirts um, with the profits, with a small bit allocated to me so I could live, uh, going to um, Black trans youth. And over that month, I was able to raise just a bit under $700. I was also giving away t-shirts to anyone um, who's black or indigenous who wanted them for free over that time period, inviting settlers or white people who wanted to support somebody more marginalized being able to get a shirt to prepay for other folks to get them. Or um, there's like always a discount code for my website for people who can't afford to pay to get things at cost. That was June. In July, I was invited to create a performance art piece for Pillory, um, which is a queer focused, um, generally evening of performance art projects, but we were transitioning to online because of where the world was set with the pandemic at that point in time. And this is just an image that I think I posted to Instagram. I really, again, wanted to make sure that I was doing something that I felt spoke to what was happening in the world around me at that point in time in a poignant way. And um, unfortunately, that was around the time that Chantel Moore, uh, Rodney Levi, Aisha Hudson, Regis Kurchinsky Packet um, had all been killed by police or had police involved thefts, whatever that means. Um, and so I guess content warning, I am talking a bit about police violence here. I'm sorry that I didn't say that sooner. Uh, I decided that if I was going to be presenting a somewhat public art piece at this point in time, I didn't want to be doing it without speaking to these things that were going on and that felt very urgent and important to me. Um, so I researched all of the police involved deaths that I could find in so-called Canada from the day that I was giving or doing this performance art piece back to a day in my own family history when I thought the police had been called on my dad during crisis. It turns out they weren't called till like a day later, which really helped make how everything turned out kind of okay, make more sense. Um, but because that was something I had believed through my life, I used that as the kind of time period and I wound up beating for each one of these people um, 110 pieces. Uh, so that was presented online, which is something that I think is amazing and I hope will continue to be really prominent following the pandemic. I really think making art more accessible to people without them having to come somewhere physical is so important. Um, and this is a screen cap of a video my friend made of her partner's phone where they were watching the live stream of my performance. And I think that's kind of the most authentic way almost to see this documentation because that's how it really happened at that point in time. Um, for the performance, I didn't want to re-traumatize or make it about um, exhibiting trauma. So I had all of these beaded pieces pinned to my body with needles, but none of that was done on camera. And what I did was I removed each of them, named each person I had found in my research and laid the beaded pieces down in medicine. Um, and they're stored in medicine right now and I will retire the project after a certain time period uh, out of respect and probably burn the pieces. Um, but at the end of taking all of these pieces off, I kind of explain a little bit of my family history. I say Mina Kawapamatin, which is until we meet again, and I wash the blood away. Um, and so that's one of the ways that my fine art practice winds up intermingled with all of this other um, making. Um, this, there is a transcript of the performance available on my website and it was available the day that I did the performance as well. And if anyone ever wants the research that I did for that to use for other projects to make more public, anything like that, that's something that I also keep available with all of the sources for my research in a spreadsheet. And then <laughs> I took a break for like a month because I was really exhausted. Um, but I felt like I couldn't keep sitting still. So I decided to do an earring raffle. And at this point in time, I was trying to get on EI um, because the pandemic continued. And so a thing that worked really amazing to not have money passing through my hands, but to be able to raise money was 
I got people to donate to a land defender or um, black associated group of their choice and just send me a screen cap of what they had donated and they got raffle tickets for that. So that was amazing because I didn't have to manage all that money. It didn't mess with me getting EI and everybody got to donate to who they wanted to. And that was really important to me too. Um, so those are just the earrings. <laughs> I uh, had a lot of time to get a lot better at beading in the last year, especially making those 110 pieces in July. Um, and that uh, project raised under $2,000, but like, yeah, 1860, I guess, in the end. Um, it's not that important to me to say these numbers, but I do think that something's real that's really amazing is over 2020 and a little bit into 2021, I was able to raise almost seven grand for different causes. And that's like not something at all within my own financial capability. And that's kind of where the web art and web activism really comes into play and is really amazing. Uh, the final thing I did in 2021 which I sort of said in an offhand way as I was doing like the online, like picking the winners of the raffle was like, I wanna make some care packages for queer indigenous youth for around Christmas. Um, and later when I posted that idea, I had only planned to make a few myself and was trying to encourage like other households to do the same. But after all the stuff I'd done, I should have anticipated that people were like, oh, hey, let me give you some money to do this. That sounds amazing. Um, and a good friend of mine, uh, Marta, also got really enthused about what I was doing and started reaching out to like some amazing creators. Um, so I had, again, a little bit under two grand in funds that came in for that. And there's a little bit of budget left. I'm hoping to do this again next year. But what that wound up going to was paying some independent creators close to cost. Some people gave me free items, paying for shipping and sending 23 um, care packages to queer indigenous youth across Turtle Island, mostly in Canada, but some in the US uh, that were probably valued over like $200 each. There was medicines, there were books, there were cheekbone beauty lipsticks, um, zines, patches, stickers, body stuff. It was incredible and it was, not something I'd ever fathomed when I came up with the idea. And I was like, so grateful to have that opportunity. Uh, so just, this is like a few of the items. Um, these are by Wes Harmon, who I totally love. This is a land back patch um, that they were using as a fundraiser too. The box of cheekbone beauty lipsticks that blew my mind. Just the process of packing things. Um, this was a package I was really excited to send to a very young drag queen and there's a lot of different lashes and stuff in there because I like conveniently won a raffle for a uh, sort of burlesque and drag night my friends run and got a lot of lashes I was never going to wear. I'm not that femme and I was like I know exactly who these are for. It was the best. Um, and that's the things I did over the last year that involve like web art and activism. And the last image I've stuck on here is again of Sema because what I'm working on right now after forcing myself to take a break once I mailed all those gifts because I was exhausted. Um, I'm working on a zine of instructions for sprouting tobacco seeds. And I have a lot of tobacco seeds from growing it last year. It produces so many seeds, it's very generous. And I'm gonna be posting on my social media soon that anyone who wants to grow their own tobacco can contact me for seeds and instructions. That's all, that's all. And I gotta find my mouse so I can stop sharing. There we go. Thanks for listening to me ramble. <laughs> That's fantastic. I just love your work and I love that you've done so much with it as well. Um, it's, uh, it's not often you see that and the efforts, the effort to go that went into everything that you did. Uh, wow, I'm, I'm really, I'm really impressed. Those earrings were gorgeous. I, I <laughs> Thank <know>. you. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm very flattered when people compliment them. I was really bad at <laughs> earrings like a year ago. Oh, they're amazing. Wow. I can't, oops, I can't do them. Um, so I'd like to, I think I'll start with a conversation with everybody here. We're actually trying to make the chat function work. Um, 
Oh, wait, I see a Q&A. Oops, no, no, I don't want to do that. Wait, so I'm trying to get some participation by the people. Okay, so I think people can actually put questions in the Q&A. Um, only hosts and panelists can see the questions. So that's all right. Um, and then, um, and then we can introduce them into the conversation. Um, there's so many things that, that each of you are doing that is so amazing. Um, the, um, I was looking up your, um, your, um, Terra Nova game, uh, maze, cause I want to download it and I want to, I want to try it. I think it, uh, it looks like a lot of fun. Uh, and why did you decide to, uh, and I think, and I think in all of there's this uh, interconnectivity between the, the Indigenous community and the non-Indigenous community. And I'm just wondering um, how, how that happened in your work. Um, I think it's funny when I see it like in the, in the TikTok, you know, obviously the, <laughs> the connection with the, with the government, you know, it's kind of, well, that makes sense. Um, but also I see it in, in the characters of the game and I see it in your interaction, Sherry, uh, with your uh, with getting support for the for the different um, causes and different activities that um, you're, you're helping to fund. Um, so when you think about that, when you think about that interconnectivity, what is it? What comes up for you? And and I will just say, please encourage you to. Um, just talk amongst yourselves like feel free to chip in and have a conversation that's kind mm -hmm. of yeah totally well i'll i'll start just giving a little bit more context about like why this story emerged um so i was in the media studies program at concordia and that's within the department of communication um communication studies and i mean that was me being a scholar at the time it was like like what what kind of game can I make that kind of encapsulates communication? What kind of like experience can I create where communication is like a game mechanic? Um, and pretty much immediately after that, I thought of um, like a complex uh, moment where communication is really important um, for indigenous people and non-indigenous people alike, which is, you know, this, this moment of first contact that's kind of like made legendary through Chris Columbus, through um, James Cook, you know, going to Hawaii and getting, you know, having that first contact experience where he just straight up, you know, was, was, um, was killed and Jacques Cartier coming down the St. Lawrence river and like encountering, um, Haudenosaunee people and like actually having like a nice experience. And so they're just like these wealth of diverse, you know, experiences with first contact and um you know like some of the outcomes that come after or immediately but then also like these uh these uh vibe, um i don't know these ripples of effects that kind of butterfly effect out from those and now we're like we're still living that currently um it's important i thought it was important to remember that so um you know these moments are going to happen again eventually um in some way shape or form and are currently still happening maybe through you know um platforms and cyberspace you know encountering one another um and stuff like that um so that was kind of like the theoretical position i was coming from but then also i felt the most comfortable telling a story that i could tell and representing myself within the narrative um, as much as possible so um like my dad is mohawk but my mom is french canadian so I kind of hold this like dual identity and I've kind of held that dual identity for my whole life. And I mean, I identify as Mohawk, but then I also have all of this experience, you know, from my mom, you know, living that, you know, um, settler perspective as well. And then also growing up um, on the West Coast near Vancouver, um, I definitely felt like my story was a very like contemporary indigenous type story about, um, growing up away from my community um, and the reserve at Six Nations, but then also um, still living a very like indigenous experience in, in rural Canada and um, 
even in, in when I moved to the city uh, as as a young as a young adult to, to go to school. So um, yeah, that's kind of where that came from. But I'm I'm also curious to know like how that intersects with Sherry and Sherry's work works. Mm -hmm. I think I love futurism so much because it offers the opportunity to talk about like the nuance of not only that things could be different in a distant future, but they could be different now. And um, more so like with my fine art practice, I, um, I think of my work as futurism a lot. And I think that being indigenous people, being in the public eye creating is a sort of futurism because it says like, we're still here and we're planning to be and we're doing something um, like, and you haven't gotten rid of us. And yeah, being Métis, that mix is important to me too. But I think the criticality and the information sharing of like Sherry's work is one of the like steps of getting us to those more optimistic, more understood futures. What do you think, Sherry? Sherry McKay. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I was raised by my grandmother whose father was a, a Swedish trapper. So he was Scandinavian and then her mom was um, indigenous. And so like they, their life was very much that like, and then my grandmother was a product of, of, of you know, two worlds um, coming together. I mean, they, they, they didn't even speak the same language yet. They kind of, you know, created this entire life, um, had a bunch of kids, got married and everything. And so like my grandmother grew up with this, she, she kind of had a struggle within her and I seen it every single day because she, you know, could be, I guess, um, kind of ambiguous in her, in her ethnicity at times. So, but then she, you know, she would know like some of her dad's language. And so like, it was kind of confusing for me growing up because my grandmother would say some things that were very derogatory to either or side of herself, but like within herself, right? And so every I knew it was wrong, but I also didn't really fully understand the whole scope of um, what she was, what she experienced growing up until I grew up and, you know, seen, you know, like you would watch a movie and you would be like, hey, that's exactly like, you know, like a first contact is like, I wonder if that's how it was when my granny <laughs> met my, met my great grandfather, you know, like, um, and that's just on my, on my mom's side, but just trying to, so when I create my content, I try and keep those things in mind. And I try and, like I said, make it digestible for, for non-Indigenous people as well. Like I try to have a tone where I'm not constantly like where I'm not aggressive and I know that that can be problematic at times too and kind of just um you know catering to non-indigenous people's feelings mm -hmm. and, but I had that with my grandmother growing up so I you know like I had to I had to navigate that with her and so like, I feel like it's very similar with me trying to create content that's, um, that, that people can consume the whole 59 seconds, <laughs> you know, that they can maybe learn something or it can inspire them or, yeah, it's definitely a challenge, but I mean, I think, I think we're all doing pretty damn good. <laughs> you have Absolutely. such a tool and buffer. For that <laughs> really appreciate <laughs> absolutely absolutely and you can see that um uh in in every example i've seen that the the work is there for the indig i i can see it in in all of your work that um it's it comes from that um sensibility it comes from that perspective and yet um it can be it can be understood from another perspective as well, in a way that I think is, is you know, um, when you were saying about being too aggressive, 
sometimes it's it's needed, but sometimes you can teach more or people can learn better when it's not. And I think using that, you know, what they say about honey as opposed to vinegar. Um, you know, sometimes they learn things that they don't mean to. Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> I feel like that's so present with like your project maze, like the sort of subtlety of bringing that conversation forward through something like beautiful. Yeah, that was definitely intentional. Um, I kind of wanted to create a little bit of a, not like a cutesy thing, but something like a visually, but like something that was approachable by any type of player. Um, I think, yeah, as Monique hinted at, like there is a aspect of Terra Nova that is for the indige, but then there's also an aspect of Terra Nova that's for the settler um, or someone who um, has a very complex uh, relationship to colonization and to first contacts. And um, yeah, I, I just wanted to, to get rid of that binary, to to maintain the binary where it was important to maintain the binary and ask and like, you know, assert indigenous presences and narratives where it needed to be asserted, but then also call into question like how we are fed first contact narratives and in, in other forms of popular media, like any sci-fi film about aliens, you know, is either about aliens coming and dominating us or us going out and dominating aliens somewhere else. Um, and it's 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 colonization, no matter like kind of how you frame it. And I wanted to create a sci-fi narrative that wasn't or kind of like not flipped it and not moved against it, but showed a different way of it working. Because clearly, the people who are in control are the people from Earth, but the people that are coming to Earth as aliens don't remember that they're originally from there. And so that creates this kind of like weird complexity and gray area about like, so does indigeneity mean that we're all human from earth or does it mean something totally different and more something about, you know, connection to community, connection to the land, connection to, you know, all of creation, you know, and, and what you're stewing, stewarding over and what you're in relation with it. Like indigeneity is like about relationships. So that was kind of what I was exploring. Yeah, it's funny uh, when you all talk about your experiences about having that identity, uh, both identities and, and um, uh, a, a membership in, in both, you know, on the settler and, and on the indigenous side. Um, my father was from Algonquin's of Barrier Lake and my mother is um, Scottish descent. So I had that same identity growing up in a time when, um, you know, we were just shitty Indians that we were, you know, <laughs> we were, we lived in the city. We didn't, you know, I spent my, my summers on the res up in Rapid Lake, but um, it wasn't, you know, nobody, we didn't realize, I didn't realize that was an, an authentic urban experience or an authentic indigenous experience. It wasn't, you know, it was either this or that. It wasn't this uh, recognized until I met an elder. Uh, her name was Wanda Big Canoe and she was amazing. And I had made some comment about, well, whether or not that was some some quality was either something I was doing was either from, you know, my mother's side or my father's side. And she looked at me and she said, you know, Monique, it's not what you are. It's what you do with it. And I had like, like just blew my mind. I, I had categorized, I had put on my little, you know, all my idiosyncrasies, all my qualities, all my into these little tiny boxes that would labeled them, you know, okay, that's Scottish, that's, you know, indige, that's, you know, mom, that's dad, you know, and it just confetti, it was like, it was, I, like it, she just blew it all away. And um, I was so fortunate to get that teach. It was later, I was in my thirties before, <laughs> before I got that, but I just love it when I see that now, when I see that, um, that, the people like the young the people coming up the the younger people there there's a different sensibility there and i love when i see what what each of you have done with that and how it has how you've incorporated that into your lives without um uh, there's a, always a journey but you know now i think it's we're more aware there's more people out there doing things there's more places to learn from. 
than there was, you know, before the internet, <laughs> during the day, the age, you know, dinosaurs, you know, <laughs> you know chisel and mortar, whatever. It is. <laughs> so I just, I think it's fantastic. And I think, you know, it's, it, it's a way the work can, can move so much further ahead when you're starting from here, as opposed to, you know, kind of back here. And I just, not that, you know, it, that older people can't, but it's just that uh, I just love when I see it. So I, I'm really, um, I'm just, I'm so impressed with everything that I've seen here. Um, and I'm wondering, so there was a question in the Q and A. Um, we're all wondering, so what are y'all gonna do this summer? What's next? And you can jump in there wherever you want to. I'm gonna leave that up to you guys. Unless you don't answer, and then I'm gonna pick somebody. <laughs> okay, Sherry, no. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I was like waiting. I was like, which Sherry is it gonna be? <laughs> um, first, I gotta get the SMA scene done, but that'll hopefully be this week and not summer, because that would be a bit late. Um, and then. I've been like learning a lot about foraging and wild foods in the last while. Um, so I'll hopefully be doing a lot of that. And as I was making my presentation for this, I was like, oh, damn, it's time for another earring raffle. So maybe that too. <laughs> That's fabulous. How about you, uh, Sherry? What are your um, I'm not too sure um definitely still like making more content and kind of just my thing is is i want to utilize my platform the best way possible um people who have like a following or doing any type of social media stuff they get really it's easy to get kind of um wrapped up in followers likes and all of those things right where now I'm kind of, those things don't really matter to me because I noticed that the, 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 the more following that I get, that the more eyes are on me. So I'm kind of, I'm just doing what I want. I know what it takes to go viral. I know what it takes to like build a following and I'm very content at where I am. So I want to utilize my platform as a way to, to uplift other content creators, to uplift other, um, indigenous creators and artisans in any way, shape or form that I can and kind of just help, I guess, help people. I, I have no idea. Like I've reached out to um, some organizations here to actually do like physical, some physical work to, to, to help, you know what I mean? Like that's where my heart is at. And so although I don't have any specific plans, it's to keep doing what I'm doing and then to try and do more ultimately. Thank you. That sounds fantastic. How about you, Mace? Um, nothing, nothing super creative lined up. Um, I love um, basically like just getting to, to talk in, in, in moments like these, because I think, um, not that I like have a lot to contribute, but I think um, uh, people want to hear about Indigenous video games and stuff. So I'm, I'm happy to talk more about that. Um, but in terms of like my role at Unity, um, it is very much like a support role. And that's like where I am more comfortable as like a person and as a creative is like, how do I support people, other people doing really awesome creative work? So I think I've kind of like found a really good niche for me right now. Um, and yeah, like, I think Unity right now has just announced um, this Unity for Humanity grant. Um, and so I'll be helping um, one of the indigenous projects of that, uh, of that grant just get the most out of Unity, um, which is amazing. They're, they're a team from, from New Zealand. So um, I, I, I feel super lucky to be like able to bring um, my skills and my knowledge as an Indigenous person like into this like pretty big company and like be uh, valued for that and um, 
given these types of opportunities to like engage with community. So that's kind of what I have coming down the pipe. Excellent. Uh, we do have another question. Uh, where'd it go? Oh dear, now I can't find it. Um, oh dear. <laughs> oh, Edgar's question about Unity yes. and rendering. Yes, um, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the Terranova is made just with kind of the basic out of the box Unity um, system and it's all kind of like pre-packaged visuals um, and rendering, but with custom artwork. So like um, just to get into the process a little bit more, Ray, the artist, he made everything from scratch in um, this program called A Sprite, um, which is almost like Photoshop, but it's like specifically for um, pixel art for video games. And so then he exported those um, digital artworks as little PNG files. And we brought those PNG files into the Unity project and placed them all around um, in this like kind of like virtual space. Um, and then when you hit play, the, the camera view in the game um, shows and you, depending on how you set up your code and stuff, um, it's interactive and you can see all the things set up in the scene. And it's called Day Sprite? A Sprite. Um, I think it's A-E-S-P-I-R-T-E. -E -E. I can't spell. I think that's right. <laughs> Excellent. Oh, good. Then we can pass that along as well. Well, great. Um, geez, it's um, we've got three minutes. Does anybody have any closing? Um, come on, Sherry, you can do it in a minute. <laughs> I, I just wanted to say, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, Bunyik. I just wanted to say, um, I think for me, the clearest through line between all of our works is community engagement um, and like making things for community. Um, or just for people who basically like people who will have us, which is really cool um, to do because I think the people like the people are coming to us <laughs> and and that is like a really privileged place to be in um, that people are like seeking seeking your content and your artwork and like my games out. That's really a really privileged place to be in. So um, yeah. yeah, I right. think we have a lot to contribute. I think you both do definitely. The web's such like a cool, magical tool for that. And I was thinking, Monique, when you were talking about like your view of us as a different generation and like feeling like we got to kind of start that much farther ahead of you, I feel like so strongly that way about like the generations that are younger than us. And yeah, it's cool, isn't it? <laughs> when you see that, it's just amazing. I guess it's such hope. It gives me yes. such hope. Absolutely. For for the future and for uh, our artists and for our our culture because there's these wonderful people coming up behind us who like you guys who are able to uh, well in in a way this is a this is a tool for for preservation I don't mean a frozen in time ice cube preservation but I mean something that captures. Um, something of us that can then have breathe, breathe and have life and, and still, you know, move on and move forward. So I think it's, uh, I think you're right, Maze. It's a very privileged place to be. And we're, I feel very fortunate to be able to be doing this kind of work and work with people like you guys. Yeah. Well, grateful too. Hmm. Well, do we have any other closing words and uh, let's see, I think we're almost out of time. Um, I got a million questions that I, you know, it always happens right at the end, oh, you know, uh, that I want to ask <laughs> about uh, things coming up and um, and, and um, how, how work can develop. Um, but I want to thank each of you very much, Kachimi Gwich, for spending this time for, with us, for sharing your work, for sharing a bit of your lives with us. Um, I, I'm just really blown away by your works and, and I really appreciate you coming out and joining with us tonight. So, so thank you, Jimmy Gwitz, thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. Me. And I hope that we can uh, work together again. I, I run, I don't know if I mentioned that, I run an, an indigenous organizations called Indigenous Culture and Media Innovations. Uh, we're a nonprofit, yay. Um, and we have a, our home office is in uh, 
uh, Mississaugas at the credit, um, but I'm here in our satellite offices here in Ottawa. So um, we do as much as we can in this area, which includes partnering with the Digital Artist Resource Center for these, um, for these lectures and hopefully a bunch more stuff. So um, with any luck, we'll be able to bring you guys in to facilitate and show work and you know all that kind of stuff. So, so. Thank you all yeah. so much. Thank, Thank you all. <laughs> Thanks, and thanks for everybody who joined us tonight. And next month, uh, we're working on another really interesting panel. Uh, I'm not going to say because it's a surprise, uh, but uh, uh, well, you can look forward to that. And uh, it'll be on the third Tuesday. Yes, third Tuesday of the month. So hope to see you again soon. I hope you guys come back. That'd be great. Okay. Well, good night for now. And take care, everybody, and stay safe. I, I always, I've been telling people, I usually say, you know, safe travels, but now I say, you know, safe travels to the kitchen. Uh, <laughs> that's as far as I get these days. <laughs> so, so, so have a good night and take care, everyone. Josh, Wabaman. Mm -hmm.